This is Kent Molgat with Kelowna Now, joined by Corrine Dolman, uh, who works for Interior Health. And I'll get you to give me your job title, which is quite a mouthful. Sure. I'm the practice lead in mental health and substance use for the overdose strategy. So we've all been hearing these terrible numbers about opioid deaths, this crisis that really is all over North America. But Kelowna, leading the way in BC for um, Mm -hmm. opioid-related deaths, how is that possible? So I I don't think we really know exactly why that is. I think there might be some contributing factors. Um, You know, things like in Cologne, I think housing is a major issue. Um, Very difficult to get substance use treatment if you don't have housing. Um, So I think that might be contributing. Also quite difficult in this community to get easy access to what's called opiate agonist treatments, which is Suboxone and Methadone that treat opiate use disorders. So that may be contributing, but I think overall we we really just don't know. Right. Has there been resistance to some of the programs that we should be bringing into Mm -hmm. place in this community, which tends to be perhaps more conservative than some? Yeah, I think there's there's some resistance. We, you know, um, we do now have a mobile supervised consumption site. Um, there was some resistance from uh, some community members. Um, I think still there's a lot of stigma around substance use. I think that um, we still like to look at it as a problem um, that other people have and uh, make some judgments around that. I think that impacts um, sort of the community's willingness to look at some you know, really innovative strategies for addressing right. some of this. You mentioned the mobile consumption site. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with that, describe what it is and how it works. Yeah, so a supervised consumption site is a place where someone can actually go and consume substances. And the intention of having a site like that is to have healthcare professionals available if you overdose, but also to provide um, information on preventing disease transmission. Um, and, and I think the big key with supervised consumption is really engaging with people to connect them to services. So often people accessing those services are very marginalized, um, don't have good connections to healthcare. Um, so they access those services and hopefully get connected to housing, to treatment, um, to other services. Right, so it's, it's serving more than just the purpose of having people uh, more safely supervised when they're doing their drugs, but it's also giving them better access to other mm-hmm. programs that they might need to solve. Absolutely. I mean, I often say that supervised consumption is all about engagement. That, that's really what it is. It's a way to engage with people um, who are very uh, deep in a cycle of addiction and be able to build a connection and hopefully a, you know, a system in moving out of it. So last year, I take it, the number of deaths in Kelowna from opioids got somewhere close to 90? So last year in 2017, I think it was 75. 75. Yeah, and it's, it, it's, not, it's from illicit drug overdoses is what it is. It's, um, and provincially, about 80%, I think, were known to be contaminated with fentanyl. But I don't have the specific data on Kelowna. But we can assume that a large percentage of those um, would have been contaminated with fentanyl. Right, yeah. So I take it fentanyl plays a huge role in many of these deaths. And my first question would be, well, why would, with all we know about fentanyl, why Mm -hmm. would anybody say, oh, I'm going to go get some fentanyl now? Yeah. But I take it in many of these cases, they're not trying to get fentanyl. They're they're trying to get some cocaine. Yep. Or some heroin. Yep, absolutely. So really it's an issue of contamination of the illicit drug market. So... Um, substances that people used to um, access and use a number of years ago are now contaminated with fentanyl. So um, for sure things like crystal meth, heroin, um, even um, what they call fake oxycodone. So uh, medications that look like their prescription medications are actually now being made with um, primarily fentanyl. So um, it really is about a contamination of, of the illicit drug market. And I think people might naively assume that your typical person who gets rushed down in the hospital and either dies or is saved is some downtown homeless person mm-hmm. they consumed in an alley somewhere. Yeah, and so that's definitely a percentage of people that are, are overdosing, but there is a significant portion of people who are overdosing and dying that um, are 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 being found in private residences and are using alone, um, and a large percent are, are males. Right. 
and using alone because I guess that's key. Mm -hmm. So the using alone is what puts people most at risk, right? So if you're using alone and you overdose, there's nobody to respond to provide you with um, naloxone, which is a life-saving um, reversal of an opioid overdose. Um, so if you're alone, then uh, very hard to get help. Right. And um, the, the, the other demographic uh, uh, that's interesting is that it skews a little older than you might have guessed. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's males going, uh, I think, between 25 and 59 is sort of the, the, the demographic um, where primarily most are occurring. And how are people getting to that stage? What, what is the path? Is, mm -hmm. it, is it people that are starting on prescription drugs mm -hmm. and winding up there? Or is it people that are starting with soft drugs? And, yeah. and, and, and which, which is more common? So I think, I think that's a great question. I think the answer is we just don't know yet. Um, but I, I'm, I would guess that it's a, it's a bit of both. So I think some of these folks are people that perhaps were prescribed an opiate medication, um, were forced to come off it or came off it and then had to go to the illicit drug market. Um, some of them may be recreational um, users that are just you know interacting with friends and, and partying um, and others that that have developed a significant dependency on a, a substance that's now contaminated so I, I think it's a variety of different paths right to this and I think for, for, for some people they'll have someone in their family that they know is drug mm -hmm. involved and, and they know there's a risk there yeah but it's really frightening when you hear about some people who just decide to really tie one on with some friend, mm -hmm. do something crazy, yeah. try some cocaine. Yeah. It's not cocaine that they're getting necessarily. Yeah, I think it's a pretty high risk time for consuming any kind of substances due to the contamination. Right. So this is an important conversation that mm -hmm. people need to have with the people that they care about. Yep. I think our message um, is really about not using alone. Um, that's the message that we're trying to get out to people. Um, as well to have access to naloxone kits um, that reverse the effects. And naloxone kits can be picked up at um, the public health center. They can also be picked up at a number of pharmacies. Um, you can go to a website called the Toward the Heart and it'll list every place where you can pick up a naloxone kit. So we really encourage people not to use alone, to have a naloxone kit available, um, use small amounts as a test um, before you use the entire dose. Um, there's a number of things that people can do to keep themselves safer. Right. It's interesting hearing you go through that list, though, because you didn't mention off the top, just don't use. Right. But I mean, I guess it gets to the point with doing what you're doing, you know, mm -hmm. that's another fight, I suppose. Well, and it's, I think we, if you understand substance use dependency, it's complicated and complex, and there's a lot of reasons why people um, use substances and get dependent on them um, that can't be solved easily. So, you know, people have uh, trauma, they have loss. Um, essentially, substance use dependency is, is usually about um, alleviating suffering, right? So I think because it's complicated and complex, we have to assume that people are likely going to continue to use, so we need to keep them safe. So if people are not alive, then they will never get well. So I think our goal and our perspective is to ensure people are kept alive, and then we look at the more long-term interventions like residential treatment or counseling, um, you know, to really resolve what's underlying the substance use. Is there something else we should be doing? Because it's, it's just not tolerable having mm -hmm. this many people, you know, winding up at hospital or winding yeah. up in the morgue. So the biggest thing that I think we need to do as a community is reduce the stigma. So I think we have to talk about substance use. I think we have to talk about it in a context of understanding that it affects many people and many families. It's not um, just a certain subset of people. Um, and if we were able to talk about it as a condition um, that people needed support for, I think people would be more willing to get help. So I think the stigma is what keeps people um, from accessing help, and I think that's what drives people to use alone and keep it secret. Right. Are you optimistic that you know, 2018 mm -hmm. might be better than last year? Well, we did see a decrease in the second part of 2017, so I have a little bit of optimism. Um, I do think that the measures that we're putting in place are making a difference. I don't know if it'll be enough of a difference. Um, I mean, I think ultimately we have to have conversations around access to safe substances for people to consume, so you get into conversations about legalization, um, those kinds of things. So it's, it's a bigger... Uh, issue 
um, the resolution, but I, I'm optimistic that we're at least heading in the right direction. Right, and if conversations like this are helpful, mm -hmm. our door is always open, Corrine. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. This is Kent Molgat for Kelowna Now.